right, if you grab your Bibles, and uh, you can stand if you want. I'm not going to. You don't want to see me fall down those stairs. It'd be really embarrassing. So, getting stronger, but not quite there yet. Okay, we're in Luke 1, 57. Now, Elizabeth's full time came for her to be delivered, and she brought forth a son. When her neighbors and relatives heard how the Lord had shown great mercy to her, they rejoiced with her. So it was on the eighth day that they came to circumcise the child, and they would have called him by the name of his father, Zacharias, but his mother answered and said, no, he should be called John. But they said to her, there's no one among your relatives who is called by that name. So they made signs to the father. You remember, Zechariah couldn't speak now. And an angel had stopped his ability to speak. There's no one among your relatives. And they made a sign to his father what he would have him called. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, saying, his name is John. So they all marveled. Immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed. And Zechariah spoke, praising God. Then fear came upon all those who dwelt around them. And all these sayings were discussed throughout all the hill country of Judea. And all those who heard them kept them in their hearts, saying, What kind of a child will this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. Now his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the things of God, prophesied, saying, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, For he has visited and redeemed his people. Blessed. And he has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. And as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, who have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. The oath which he swore to our father Abraham to grant that we, being delivered from the hand of his enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And the child will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins through the tender mercies of our God, with which the day spring from on high has visited us. The word day spring is one of the names for Jesus. So you add a name to your vocabulary of the Redeemer. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it speaks to us about the importance of family, raising godly children, obeying you, walking with you, and your call on each and every one of our lives. So speak to us now from your word, we ask. Send your Holy Spirit to teach us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated, please. So this chapter has taken us three weeks to go through, and some of you are going to say, yeah, come on. But it contains just amazing truths that we need to understand that really only appear here. Dr. Luke, uh, he is in fact a physician, uh, has written a lot of information in this first chapter that if we didn't have it, we wouldn't understand a lot about the families of John the Baptist as well as Elizabeth's niece, which would be Mary, the mother of Jesus. So this section right here is a prophecy about the coming Messiah. And we get this name, Dayspring, that turns out to be very, very important. It's also translated from the east, meaning the sun that comes up from the east on a dark world. Because to first century Jews, they saw the darkness as something that was a struggle, that often brought depression, and some people actually would hide out in darkness in caves, etc. But Jesus was the light, L-I-G-H-T, coming to the world, and Zechariah is the one who announces it. Now, that's interesting because Zechariah 
got into a little trouble, you remember. He was the priest who was chosen to light the incense in the temple. And he was there in the temple months before this and uh, doing this highest honor, something that every priest uh, wanted to do during his lifetime. He only did it once. Once you did it, then you were disqualified. Well, his lot was chosen, and he goes into the holy place, which is in front of the veil. You remember the veil that was torn when Jesus died on the cross. And he's standing in front of the veil in front of a bronze altar, And it is called the altar of incense because that's where they poured hot coals and they poured incense over the top of them. And the smoke of the incense, which was symbolic, but also very important, the prayers of the people. And the smoke would go up and wrap around this veil and go into the Holy of Holies, the holiest place where the Ark of the Covenant was. So he is in the closest he'll ever get to God on earth in the first century, uh, and except when he meets Jesus. Uh, but he's in this place, and he's burning incense, and he's excited. But all of a sudden, an angel, not any angel, angel Gabriel, who makes a claim. He's the one that stands next to the throne of God. I don't know how many other angels are next to the throne of God, but he is the one that says, I was standing next to the throne of God just a few minutes ago. Now I show up in the temple and tell you you're going to have a son. Here's Zacharias' uh, response. First uh, chapter 1 of Luke 18. And Zacharias says to the angels, how shall I know this? How do I know if you're telling me the truth? Really, that's pretty bold. How many times have you talked to an angel in your life? How shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife, well advanced in years, he throws her under the bus. It'll be her fault. She's older than I am. So they're both in their 80s and the angel says, you're going to have a son and his name is going to be called John. And he says, I don't think so. (laughs) Give me a sign. And Gabriel says, here's your sign. I'm Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God and was sent to speak to you and to bring you these good tidings. This is good news. But behold, because you will be mute, unable to speak, until the day these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. So now it's months later. Elizabeth is ready to give birth to this child, who turns out to be John, the John who will introduce Jesus, we call him John the Baptist. He really was a Methodist. Not, yeah, that's a bad joke. And, uh, and John uh, is called a Baptist because he baptizes Jews into a relationship with God. And he's the one that points out Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And so this is the announcement of what John will be, the forerunner, the one who announces that Jesus is the Messiah and coming to change the eternal destiny of millions upon millions of people. So that's this section. And so the birth uh, in verse 57 through 66, and then the song, the Benedictus, this is the the song, it's not really a song in the sense that we don't know what the melody line was, but Zacharias spoke this. It's more like a poetic song, uh, and it speaks of the Messiah coming and then his preparation of the last verse. So that's where we're going, and there's all kinds of nuggets hidden in here, as there have been in the first two parts of chapter one, and uh, it will give you insights into things you won't see anywhere else in scripture. Verse 57. Now Elizabeth full time, so she's come to the ninth month, uh, for her to be delivered, and she brought forth a son. Well, that's what the angel said would happen. She's going to have a son. She's not surprised. She believed what her husband told her the angel said. God said it would happen, and it did. She takes it right in. Her husband, not so much yet. Verse 58. And when her neighbors and relatives heard how the Lord had shown great mercy to her, they rejoiced with her. It was a miraculous supernatural birth. 85-year-old women don't have normal childbirth, much less in the first century 
where the fatality rate at childbirth was about 51%. So God has shown her great mercy. She's alive. She made it through delivering the baby, and the baby's in great health. But that's what God said would happen. And when God says it, it happens. If you were with us last week, it said that nothing is impossible for God. And so he didn't break out a sweat making this happen. It was what he wanted to happen, and so it did. Now, verse 59 is very interesting to me. It says, now so it was on the eighth day that they came to circumcise the child. So circumcision on a Jewish baby always happened on the eighth day. That's what Leviticus 12.1 said. But there's something, if you're not in tune to this, you'll miss it. This is the verse that I use often when I'm trying to share the Lord with atheistic scientists, particularly those in the science of biology. Because this is talking about the ability of the human body to clot, to, in fact, stop us from bleeding to death. We live in, the, in a balance, very careful balance. And if you go, if you have too many coagulation factors, you begin to throw clots. Uh, it's in the news right now because of some of the people who took the Johnson and Johnson vaccine, they've been having some blood clots appear in their legs, phlebitis, as well as in their brain. And that's scary. But that's the extreme when the system isn't working right. It's too sensitive, and a clot is a. a a bunch of platelets, one of the three uh, groups of cells in your bloodstream, that look like little sponges under a microscope. Sorry, I'm going into detail, but you're going to be amazed when you see what's going on here. And they clump together, and they stop the body from leaking in various... Cut yourself, platelets will run to that, and they'll begin to form a mesh, fibrinogen mesh, and I don't want to bore you to death with all the details. But we didn't understand, we, science, didn't understand that until 1921. In 1921, a German scientist, Gorfman, discovered this coagulation factor, uh, K, uh, C, uh, with a hard K sound, and it turns out he got it right. Now, the Old Testament, Leviticus 12, I said, is where this appears, was written at least 3,400 years ago. Moses writes down the book of Leviticus and writes in it in chapter 12 that you only circumcise a baby boy on the eighth day. So what, you say? The eighth day is the only day in that boy's life well, he will have a full complement of the entire coagulation factors that he'll ever need to keep him from bleeding to death when they circumcise him. Now, how did Moses know that? He's a really smart coagulation scientist 3,400 years ago. No. God said, write this down, and someday... Those idiots in the 20th century will figure out how this works. And they go, oh, that's why we wait to the eighth day. I submit to you that the Old Testament is filled with those kinds of scientific facts. They've been, you can go back and look at a 200 BC document from the Dead Sea Scrolls that has that verse in it. 200 years before Jesus. So how did all that get in the Old Testament, these understandings about science and the human body? God planted those nuggets there so we in the 20th and 21st century will look back and go, hey, maybe this book is uh, more than just a book. Maybe God is saying something to all of us about how he's planned all these things from before the foundation of the earth. So... Here's this little nugget here. On the eighth day, that's all it says. It doesn't go into all this biochemistry about coagulation. It's just um, on the eighth day because that's when everybody was doing it because that's what Leviticus 12 said. But why? Because the creator wrote it into his word. So we would look back and go, hey, maybe I can trust God with my life. The big decisions I have to make, whether to buy a Ford or a Chevy, 
You get the picture. All right. So it kind of makes me feel real stupid when I'm thinking that way. You know, I got to make a big decision today. I think God's already thought all this through. Just relax. So on the eighth day, the whole family shows up. They got a couple of rabbis. They got elders from the local synagogue. And this little boy is going to be circumcised. And during that time, first century, that's when they gave the child their names. And it was normal to call a boy his father's name or his grandfather's name. That was the tradition. The tradition. God didn't say it. It's not in the Bible. It had become another one of those traditions that Jesus said, you make much of the traditions of man. You say they're more important than the law of God. The word of God precedes the traditions of man. Here's one of those traditions. Well, they should call his name Zacharias. That's out of respect for the father. You want this child to be like his dad. And his mother said, no. (laughs) Which might have been a little shock. In fact, it says it's a shock. No, he shall be called John. Now, the word John means a gift from God. It's not a bad name. It's a great name. Their problem with it is that no one in the family has that name. But they said, there's no one among your relatives who is called by that name. Now, the thinking was, you want the child to be like his father. If we called him little Zach after his dad, then he would think he's supposed to be a priest like his father was. And follow him around and learn how to do priestly things. God said, no. This little baby boy will not be a priest. In fact, he will upset the traditions of man over and over again. He calls Israel to come to the Jordan River down at Perea and be baptized. Jews who were already Jews didn't get baptized until John said they need to. And they came. And it says all of Judea came. Tens of thousands of people came down to the River Jordan and were baptized by this kid. This is his day. This is the day he's getting his name. Had his name been Zacharias, then maybe he would have thought, well, I I, I need to be a priest. Instead, he goes clear the other way, against the priesthood. So, this is the first of many man-made traditions that were about to be broken by him and the one he introduces, Jesus. So they made signs to his father that he would, what he would have him called. So they assumed, well, maybe dad would overrule the mother. And surely he would want the kid named after himself. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote his name is John, not is going to be. Name already is. The angel named him. Now, this is a defining moment, a crossroads in Zachariah's life. He was feeling pretty proud when he was in that. Uh, in front of that altar of incense because his name had been called. He's the most important priest in Israel that day. And it went to his head. And the angel said, call his name John. He said, how will I know this is God? (laughs) Uh, I'm an angel. (laughs) Uh, Well, give me a sign. Okay, you're not going to speak. Your wife's going to get kind of big too, but you're not going to talk the entire time. So he asked for a writing tablet. Now, uh, this is an unusual Greek word. It only appears once in the New Testament. It's not a slate. You know, in the early days, uh, 1800s, they put rock slates on it, and they used chalk to write on it in a classroom or something. Or you had a little one that you would write your letters on, right, if you were in elementary school. But this is something different. This is a flat piece of wood that they took a candle and they flowed the hot wax all over this flat piece of wood. And then they used the candle to smooth it all out. And then the person would use what they called a stylus, just a little stick, a pointed wooden stick, and would write the letters out in the wax so it would be more permanent than slate. He wanted to save this. He said, I want you to know this is important. His name is John. And this is the defining moment for Zacharias' life where he is going to trust God when he can't see where he's going. We all come to that point in our lives. Sometimes 
It's a small thing. Sometimes it's a crossroads that's really hard to step across. But every one of us will face that decision in our lives. Am I going to believe God? This is what his word says. Or am I going to trust my own instincts? What I've learned so far. I learned so much in third grade. I should be able to handle life. So this is his, Zacharias's defining moment. He's doing much more than just giving a boy, his boy, a name. He's deciding to acknowledge that God is Lord of his life. And immediately, as soon as he did what God had told him to do through the angel months earlier, verse 64, his mouth was open, his tongue loosed, and he spoke, praising God. And somehow, at that very moment, God, obviously, his tongue is let free, and he's able to prophesy, speak the words of God. And all the people around are going to hear it. Now, Dr. Luke skips over that to give us a little introduction to say how many people were amazed by this. Verse 65, then fear came on all those who dwelt around them. And all these sayings were discussed throughout all the hill country of Judea. We think this is the city of Hebron, although we're not tall. Uh, 20 miles around Jerusalem, in other words. And all those who heard them, these words, that Zacharias decided to let the boy be called something his family had never had that name in his family history before. All those who heard them kept them in their hearts. They knew there was something different here, saying, what kind of child will this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. That's a really important phrase that appears seven times in the New Testament. And the hand of God was on his life. The hand of God was on her life. The hand of God can be seen on children's lives. I suggest you look for it. I've seen it many times. It's amazing when it happens. You meet a kid and you think, what a cute kid or something. And then they say something spiritual and they're like six years old. And you begin to look at that kid and then you watch him for a while. And you realize that the Holy Spirit is doing something in that kid's life. There's two kids in this church right now that I'm kind of watching from afar. I haven't said anything to their parents, but I'm looking at this kid going... God's going to use this kid to change the world. I don't know if it's going to be an author. Uh, he's, he's going to be a, some kind of television, Christian television producer, a film producer. But there's something about this kid that is going to be really, really important. Now, we all think our kids are super, right? But I'm suggesting you should treat your kid that way. You should treat your kid as if he's a gift from God. And the hand of God, as it says here, was with him. And then expect God to do amazing things through your children or your grandchildren or your great-grandchildren. Doesn't really matter. Nephews, nieces, all those qualify. So this kid has something going on in his life. And, of course, we know it to be true now, years later. Verse 67. Now his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Spirit. That's an unusual thing at this point in the history of the church. Pentecost hasn't happened and won't happen for 20 years later. But Zacharias is filled with the Holy Spirit inside him. Take out your heart of stone, God said. I put a heart of flesh inside you. I will put my Holy Spirit inside you. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. That's his promise of the new covenant. So when we surrender our life to God, we surrender to his Holy Spirit to come inside us and begin to change us from the inside out. That's his promise. I will cause you to walk in my ways. That's one of the most hopeful scriptures I can think of. That it's not by my power or my strength or my New Year's resolutions that I'm going to become more like Jesus. No, he's going to give me the desire to be like him. He's going to change my want to. And that's what's going on here. The Holy Spirit comes into Zacharias and he prophesies. He speaks the words of God. Blessed is the Lord God of Israel. 
Now, this is the Benedictus. If you grew up in the high church, you know, like uh, Lutheranism or Catholicism or something, then the Latin Vulgate version of the Bible, the first three words of it is this word, Benedictus. It, it's like a song. So this is Zachariah's song after he's filled with the Holy Spirit. Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. God showed up inside this baby, inside his mother, Mary. You remember John and uh, Elizabeth and Mary and the two babies inside their rooms. When they got in the same room, the, the babies jumped up and down in their mother's stomach. They recognized, it. I don't know how, but they recognized each other. God showed them that. So he has, he, capital H, God, has visited his people and redeemed, bought back his people. It means to buy a slave. To buy a slave out of slavery and to set them free. Now, when I went to Nigeria three and a half, almost four years ago, I was shocked to find out that there were slaves for sale in northern Nigeria. That you could buy a human being from 400 to $800, depending on their age and strength. This is the 21st century. How is that possible? It's possible, and it's going on in Africa. The slave traders are Muslim. I say that publicly on the radio. Hello? <laughs> Keep those cards and letters coming. I met them. I talked to the slave traders, and they were all practice of Islam. So, he's redeemed, bought back. This is the way Peter describes it, 1 Peter 1.18. Knowing that you were not redeemed, not paid for, and the word means the price of a slave, that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like gold and silver, but from your aimless conduct received by traditions from your fathers, just doing what your fathers told you to do. But with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, perfect lamb. He indeed was foreordained before the foundations of the world and was manifested in these last times for you, displayed for you to see, who through him believe in God. Through Jesus, we believe that God exists and created all things. Who raised him from the dead, wrote Jesus from the dead, gave him glory, let them see who he really was, the ruler of heaven and earth, so that your faith and hope are in God. Wow. Your faith, your trust, is not in your ability not in your education, not in your name, not how much money you were given, not how many degrees you have after your name, but your faith is, in, your trust is in God, that he has control of your life. He's doing these things in your life. Can you do that? Can you trust God when you can't see him? Now, verse 70. <laughs> Oh, I missed the horn of salvation, 69. Raised up a horn of salvation. The, the metaphor, the picture here is of a animal that has a large horn, like a big horn sheep. The larger the horn they saw in the Old Testament times is showing the power of that animal to save itself from a hunter or something like that. So the horn of an animal is this weapon for defense and a picture of how strong it is. The horn of salvation for us in the house of the servant David, King David. David thought his uh, sons were always going to sit on his throne. God said that, but that's not what he meant. He said there would always be a son of David on the throne of David forever, meaning Jesus Christ would be on that throne forever. And he is the horn of salvation, the strength, the power of salvation for you and me, not under our own power. It's like that old phrase, if our greatest need had been for information, God would have sent an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent an economist. 
But our greatest need was forgiveness and redemption. Therefore, God sent a savior that we need forgiveness from God and to be redeemed, bought back the price of a slave. And so he sent the savior of, of the world. Verse 70, and as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets down through the ages, who have been since the world began. Abraham is the first one in the Old Testament that is uh, pictured as giving a prophecy, the words of God that God would say. Genesis 20, verse 7, uh, Abraham is before a king named Abimelech. And Abraham has lied, the father of our faith. Abraham has lied to him and said that his wife Sarah was in fact his sister. So Abimelech was attracted to her, wanted her to join his harem. So Abraham was afraid he was going to die. So he said, oh, yeah, just my sister, take her. So there's a hundred jokes there. I'm not going to say any of them. Genesis 20, verse 7. Now, therefore, word of God, restore this man's wife, God says to Abimelech, the king. For he is a prophet. He speaks my words. And he will pray for you and you shall live. But if you do not therefore restore her, know that you shall surely die and you and all who are yours, your whole family will be wiped out. So Abimelech rose early in the morning and did so. He believed him. That's the first prophecy that, or prophet that were described in the Bible itself. I told you a lot of nuggets in here. So verse 71, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who would hate us. God still has that desire to save your life. How much trouble are you in? How many difficulties did you drag into church this morning with you? I'm, I'm never surprised when I talk with people who, who get saved in a service and they said, you know, I just driving by and uh, I asked somebody, hey, what is this building? It's a packing house. What, they got orange juice? No, it's a church. Why do they call it a pa- Never mind. I'll just go inside. And then God speaks. And then you find out later that they were, you know, coming from a bank robbery. It's happened. Or coming from some other mess with the law. Or in their own family. Or financial. Or health-wise. And God is in the process of saving us. Verse 72, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. Wow, you guys have been asking too many questions. We're going to run out of time here. Oh, God's the God of mercy. The oath which he swore to our father, Abraham. And Abraham believed the Lord and God accounted it to him as rightness. Belief, trust, is how Abraham got into heaven. Did he earn it? No. He trusted God, just like you have to, just like I have to. In holiness and righteousness, verse 75, before him all the days of his life. And 76, as your child, and your child, excuse me, will be called the prophet of the highest. Now he's talking to, Zechariah is talking to his wife and all the people that are there. And he's saying, your child, Elizabeth, will be called the prophet of the highest. And Mary, who evidently is there, for you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. John the Baptist is going to prepare the way of Jesus. Verse 77, to give knowledge of salvation, information about salvation to his people by the remission, the removal of their sins. Remission. Remission means all the signs and symptoms of the disease disappear. American Cancer Society said complete cancer remission may continue for several years and be considered cures, but that doesn't mean it isn't possible for it to come back. And so we get remission from our sins, but we still stumble. And God just tells us to come and confess them. Verse 78, through the tender mercies of our God, what we don't deserve, his love, with which the day spring, and there it is, the messianic title of Jesus. It it appears two more times in scripture, Isaiah 60 
in Malachi 4.2. It usually is translated rising sun. This is the new King James, and it follows the same translation of the old King James. If you're looking at NIV, it says the rising sun. The New American Standard calls the sunrise from on high. The New American Standard refers to the Son of God, so it's in caps. It is a general term still used today, but he's describing his death as a departed. The time of my departure is at hand, Paul said concerning this. He knew that his life was ending, but he was looking forward to seeing the Son of Righteousness, the sun coming up in the east, that's the picture, it's dark, and it's coming, and bringing light to the world, the way of peace, light, light is the, is the picture here. Um, 79, to give light to those. I'd like to read you, I don't know, 30 scriptures about light, but we don't have time. You have to look them up yourself. Verse 80. Hey, we come to church, so you do that, Pastor. I know, I know. So the child grew, verse 80, and became strong in spirit, John the Baptist, and was in the desert until the day of his manifestation to Israel. We know that uh, Jesus came and pointed out John, and uh, he would wear strange clothing, camel's hair. He would eat locusts and honey and have full head of hair, beard all the way down. And he was the one who would introduce Israel to the Messiah. (sighs) I have three pages of clothes and it's two minutes late already. God has called us out of darkness into light. He is the light. He's the one that gives us moral understanding how this world works. He gives us a worldview of what's really important. It's not found in degrees. It's not found in money. It's not found in power. It's found in him personally. That's what Zacharias discovered. Do I submit to what God wants me to do and call the kid John? Didn't seem like a big deal. You know, maybe I was just uh, mistaken that I had a little acid reflux and that wasn't really the angel Gabriel in there and that it really was unusual that my wife and I had a baby at 80 years old. You can explain that away, right? Except he knew in his heart of hearts that God was calling him to something, to follow him. He calls us all to do that. Would you stand please and we'll pray together. Thank you, Lord, that you have called us out of darkness and into light and that you are still doing that today. And Lord, we pray for anyone who's with us this morning who hasn't surrendered to you and pray that you give them grace now to surrender. Christian, please pray. Now, maybe you're here for the first time. Maybe you've been here before, but God wants you to give your life to him so he can cleanse you from your sin and take you to heaven for eternity. So if you've never surrendered your life to God, this is the moment right now is the right time. I wouldn't do anything to embarrass you, but if you'd like to know that your sins are forgiven, who wouldn't? If you'd like to know that you're going to spend eternity with God in heaven, if you're ready to surrender your life to God, would you let me know you're ready by looking up at me and raising your hand? I won't embarrass you. God bless you. I'll just point you out and remind you. I see your hand. God bless you. A couple, two of you in the back. Anyone here behind? Yes, behind the prayer. Yes, and you, God bless you, and you, sir, and you, young lady, and you, yes, God bless you. If I miss your hand, don't worry, God didn't. If you raise your hand, God's listening. Would you please pray these words with me of surrender? We're going to ask God to forgive our sins. He's going to do it right where you're standing. Everybody, please say, Lord Jesus, I surrender. I give you my life. Please forgive my sins in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.